Hey yo, I'm Miss Linnea Lark, and I'm a high school art teacher in 2021. So you should pray for me, like right now, or maybe again even later. Anyway, I'm excited to bring you this underglazing video on my precious panderfly. In my panderfly sculpting video, which you can watch by clicking the card above, ended before the bis firing, and lots of you had questions. So let's go ahead and start this video right there. As many of you have asked, I did not take the paper out of my sculpture before firing it. I didn't have any adhesive or tape inside, so I wasn't too concerned. But this can cause wear and tear on your element, so beware. Also, the reason I can get away with this indoors is that my school has a fire alarm that actually measures the temperature in the room and sounds the alarm if it rapidly increases. So a little bit of smoke that might creep out of our ventilator will not cause me any problems. You need to consider your setup before you make that decision for yourself. I was in a hurry when I made this piece. If I had had more time, I would have cut her in half at leather hard and then pulled out her stuffing and then slipped and scored her back together again. Although I will say that this project would have been a little bit challenging to do that because the clay was very thin in areas. But I mean, you can always just squish some extra clay in there. It's not the end of the world. After I sculpted her, I loaded my panderfly into the kiln and let's be honest, it was probably a little too wet. But I did a nice long firing with lots of holds and here is a quick look at the firing schedule. Thank you at Preston's Pottery. Preston's one of my alumni and so is Anakin Art. You can buy their art here. But look, she made it through and without a single crack. Woohoo! When I'm unloading the kiln, I am careful not to move too quickly or I run the risk of blowing the ash all around. I gently empty the kiln, put on a dust mask, grab a large sponge, and roll over the trash can. I carefully dump the ash into the trash can and then wipe it away with a damp sponge. And I'm all done. That's literally as easy as it is. Let's move on to planning the design. I start off by making three thumbnails. I chose a plushy design, a realistic design, and a floral design because I can't help myself. In the end, guess what? <laughs> I chose the floral design. Who would have guessed? I cannot tell you how much I love painting tedious, beautiful patterns on pots. Like, I love it so much. So much joy. Now that I have a design and color scheme in mind, I start by mixing the background color. When mixing colors, be aware that underglazes look significantly lighter once you've painted them on and they've dried a bit. Now this is one of the hardest parts of using underglazes because once they are clear gloss glaze, they actually become several shades darker than when they looked when they were wet and you were mixing them. I know, it's crazy. They get lighter and then they get eventually even darker. The first pots I ever underglazed all turned out way too dark. I could barely see the details. And oftentimes my paintings were hard to see because they were so dark. So always mix with more white in your colors than you think you need. Because I want this teal background color to be solid and opaque, I am careful to paint three layers of underglaze on. It's crucial that you allow your layers to dry before you touch them or paint on extra layers. If you don't do three layers and you don't wait for it to dry, your color is going to turn out patchy. I can guarantee it. The first layer is easy to paint because it is easy to see the white areas you missed or haven't gotten to yet. The second and third layers, on the other hand, are a wee bit more tricky because it's teal on teal and the underglaze dries quickly, so it's easy to miss or forget areas. This is why before I start each layer, I make a firm route and order that I will paint, and I do not deviate from it. I went from the head to the belly to the front legs to the sides to the back to the back legs to the tail. If you lose track, 
Play it safe and do four layers of underglaze. Between you and me, in some areas I put more than 12 layers on this piece. I've heard some people talk about how you can only put a certain amount of layers of underglaze on. That has never been my experience. All right, let's transfer that design. With my thumbnail and drawing references at the ready, I start to draw out the magnolia flowers and leaves onto this thin paper. This floral style will have the flowers, leaves, and branches repeating a lot. And since I am lazy and it is much easier to draw on a flat piece of paper than on a 3D sculpture, I draw six variations of a magnolia flower that I can use to trace onto my sculpture. I then use carbon paper or graphite paper to trace the flower drawings on their backs. This will give me a mirror image of each of the six flowers, which in the end gives me a total of 12 different flower drawings that I can trace onto my pattern fly. I use carbon paper to trace my flowers first and then hand draw their branches and then lastly I trace in the leaves. Some of you may be wondering why I chose magnolia blossoms. Well, when I was a teenager, I went to a music festival in Nashville. It was on the front lawn of the Parthenon. There was a huge magnolia tree set a little ways back from the crowd, and I needed a break from all the hoopla and climbed its giant limbs. Before I realized it, I was at the very top of this ginormous tree. The highest I had ever climbed a tree. I remember nobody knew how high I had climbed and it was rather frightening. Not so much the climbing as the doing it alone. I don't know why that was weird but it was. But once I got up there the view of the festival, the Parthenon and downtown Nashville was so amazing I will never forget it. The crazy part is that pandas do the exact same thing. They'll climb all the way up to the very tippity top of a tree by themselves, perch on a tiny top branch, and then dangle their legs for fun. It's one of the things I love about them. Anyway, all my lines are on my sculpture. It's time to mix the rest of my colors. If you'd like a little more info on underglazing, check out the video in the card above. But for now, just know that I'm mixing lighter colors than I want and using complementary colors to tone down the brightness of my colors. Notice that to make olive green, I use a little bit of red to muddy the color because red and green are complementary colors. Hey, that's a pro tip. I gave you that for free. Because red and green are complementary colors, they should give me more earthy colors when I carefully mix them together. When mixing, remember to add little amounts at a time. You can always add more later if you need to. But once you go too far, all you can do is really start over. And then all that underglaze is wasted. Painting from the background to the foreground. I always paint the background first and then work my way towards the front. Places are actually like that. They're just oh, um, that is true. Yeah. <gasps> no! What just happened? Oh no! Glue back on. Hot glue. Hot glue? No. <laughs> oh my goodness. It's funny now, but at the time I was devastated and didn't know what to do about it. I literally felt sick. I could hear the voice of my ceramics professors telling me that there was nothing I could do and I knew hot glue was not going to work. So I decided to do what any hopeful artist would do in this situation and totally decided to forget and avoid that break. Like it never happened. So I continued painting my leaves. Three coats on each and the same for the red line work. Except I actually did four coats on the red lines because red tends to run on the thin side. And I was putting it on a pretty dark color. It's then onto the blossoms, which I will be using my watercoloring technique on. This means that the first color should be solid, opaque, and light. So I paint three layers of creamy white covering all that line work that I traced on earlier. 
Don't worry, I took pictures to help me redraw it back on after my third layer. I use my photographs to redraw in my blossoms line work and then I'm on to the watercoloring. All the lines that I just drew will burn out in the next firing. They won't be visible. But before I fire them, they will help me paint on more details to the blossoms using the watercolor technique. Using the watercolor technique, I use many layers of watered down under glazes to paint in the flower details. I make sure that my dark pink and red layers cover each line and that each line is defined by contrasting colors. So on one side of the line it's darker and on one side of the line it's lighter. This will give the impression of a line without actually having an outline. This is super important because just like I said, all those pencil lines will be gone after the firing. Notice on this blossom that the darker pinks are painted in areas that would be more shadowy in real life. And also those dark colors help to find each petal. Also notice that the light pink is used gently with the white for the highlights. When using the watercolor technique, you want the layers transparent. So you don't have to worry about there being three coats here or there. You will probably have way more than three if I'm being honest, but they will remain see-through because each layer is watered down. Don't worry, that's what it's supposed to look like. I keep adding layers until I achieve the contrast and style that I'm aiming for and all the lines have turned into edges of contrast. I do the tree branches similarly as I did the blossoms, but instead of using that creamy white as the base, I use the lightest green color as my base. I start with three opaque coats, making sure each layer is dry before starting the next one. Now I need to mix my shadow and detail colors, which I'll use the watercolor technique on as well. I make a few dark greens and a few purpley browns to mix shadow colors. 
I was careful to apply these transparent values in a liney texture to fit with the movement and texture of tree bark. I make sure my darker values are on the edges and in areas of shadow. I'm also careful not to add much darkness to the green buds so that they look light and newly formed like baby growth. Now that my floral design is finished and everywhere, I move on to drawing all the animal detail shapes. Now, most of the animal areas are actually behind the floral areas. Technically, I should have painted those first. And look how difficult it's gonna be to paint these side by side, the flower details. I'm gonna have to go around all of those details. It's a tedious nightmare to be sure. But the reason I didn't put the stripes down first is because underglaze is so thick that it creates a bumpy texture and I didn't want the flowers to be raised in areas that overlap the stripes. I want them to be painted side by side on the same layer to avoid bumpy areas beneath the flowers. So here I go doing the hardest part, painting around the flower details super closely so that I can't see any teal between them, but also careful not to overlap and lose areas of those branches and flowers. While I'm talking about challenges, I should go ahead and mention that painting 3D sculptures is no walk in the park. I'm always looking for a strong area to stabilize my hand or pinky finger on so that my edges are compressed and smooth. Painting around the tail was also very difficult as well as underneath the body. But eventually all the body details were finished and I had to face the music. Time to figure out what I could do about that wing. During the shutdown, I did a lot of research. I was looking for some way to patch the wing that would last through more firings because I still had to do the underglaze firings and the glaze firing. And if I couldn't find a way, which I had been led to believe didn't exist by anyone I'd ever met in the clay community in real life or on the internet, then I would glaze it separately and glue it back on at the end, which would most likely leave a crack and the wing would be very weak, which was not optimal. So I kept on reading and looking for answers. I read blogs, I did Google searches, I watched YouTube videos, I almost gave up because I didn't know what I was looking for and I didn't know how to request it. I asked Google how to fix Bisquare. And you know what Google told me? It told me all about Bisfix. Have you ever heard of it? I had never heard of it. I didn't know what in the world it was. In fact, I asked my computer out loud, what is Bisque Fix? <laughs> I wasn't sure, but after reading the title, I couldn't help but think it was the answer to all my problems. Even if this ridiculously expensive patching mud made me feel lied to by every ceramics professor I had ever had. You see, I only took wheel throwing classes in college because I was too intimidated to take the sculpture classes. In fact, this is only my third sculpture ever. But the point is, pottery teachers don't teach students how to patch cracks or reattach handles or fix broken pottery. Their philosophy is rightly so, just make a new one and learn a lesson. They wouldn't buy a $40 solve to fix a mug they probably won't make $40 profit on once you factor in all the costs. It just makes no sense. But I wasn't exactly feeling like I could just sit down and sculpt another panderfly and glaze it real quick. I had painstakingly sculpted and underglazed it. I seriously watched every episode of The Office and Parks and Rec glazing this thing. Like that's how much time it took. This $40 solve was a godsend. So I ordered it and received it in a week. I was ready to roll. So let's talk about Amico's Bisque Fix. First, I practiced reattaching the wing and getting familiar with how the pieces fit together. I then read the label which was super short. 
It said it could go on greenware or on bisqueware, so I applied a little, not knowing how strong it was and not wanting to have to sand a bunch of excess off later. But it wasn't enough and wouldn't stick, so I quickly sponged off all the bisfix, trying not to clog any of the pores that would allow it to fit together perfectly like a puzzle piece. And then I tried again, this time applying more bisque fix. I held it firmly in place until it took root. Honestly, I was shocked at how fast it dried and how strong the bond was. but I was still paranoid. So I used a paintbrush to apply a wee bit more on the outside of the crack. Once it was hard and dry, I used a ceramic nail file for my home to file it down and get it more smooth. I blew off any dust from the sanding and began painting it. For the wings, I used the opaque painting technique, so no watercolor here. So I used three layers of every color, and I switched up the colors a few times, but was happy with the colors I settled on. Something a little bit darker. And then there was nothing to do but to fire it again. When it came out, I did not like how light the purple areas were. I thought it looked more like a dark purple instead of a purpley black, like I wanted. So I remixed and repainted all the purple animal areas, which if you recall was the hardest part. I had to do it again. <laughs> I had to do three layers again. So a total of six layers in those areas alone. And then, like a stinking lazy baby noob, I thought it'd be fine if I only did two layers. What was I thinking? Am I not always telling you guys you have to do three layers? And then sure enough, look what happened when it came out of the bis firing. I could see all the brush strokes. And so I did a third layer and put it through a fourth bisque firing. Oh my goodness, learn from my mistakes. But this time it came out singing my song. I wasn't sold on that teal color to tell you the truth, but I was thinking it was too light and I seriously thought about repainting the whole background. But honestly, at this point, that thought was soul crushing. And so I applied three thin and strained layers of clear matte glaze and put it through the last firing of my 2020-2021 school year. It literally came out right after the last day of school. I was and am ecstatic with how it turned out. I very rarely love something that I make this much. I always feel like I could have done something better. I could have done something different to make it more interesting, but I am just super pleased with my pander fly. I love it. And I love her. And she will always be a reminder to me that when everything goes wrong and the world is falling apart and you have little to no hope left to dig deep, ask questions, look for knowledge and rely on faith that you will find the way through all the obstacles. Yeah, Panderfly, you're my friend. You're my best friend. I love you. I made you. I built you. I want to hold you and pet you. I love you. That's weird. But artists, you know what I'm talking about. After I make something, I just want to like hold it for 24 hours straight. I do not want to set it down. I cannot be the only one. Anyway, thank you all for watching and I hope you enjoyed it and learned something. And I just wanted to show you some color comparisons between when it's wet, when it's dry, after it's been bis fired, and then after it's been glaze fired. Hope that's helpful to you guys. 
Figuring out the colors is probably the hardest part. Good luck. I also want to thank Amico for making and selling this fix. This video is not sponsored by them. I just love them right now. Bless you. And I hope you all have a stinking happy day. Bye.